I'm Mark von Keitz, and I'm a program director at RPE. I would like to kick off this ocean-themed session with a concept of floating energy islands. The oceans cover 70% of the Earth's surface and are full of energy. Waves, tidal flows, and strong winds are powerful reminders of how much energy there is, but also how challenging it can be for humans to operate in the offshore environment. Nonetheless, there is a steadily growing effort to tap into the ocean's renewable energy potential. Pursuing offshore wind, wave and tidal power, but also seaweed cultivation, floating solar and ocean thermal energy conversion. Over the last few years, offshore wind has emerged as the front runner. Europe already has 12 gigawatt capacity in the water today and has clear goals to increase this to 60 gigawatts by 2030 and 300 gigawatts by 2050. The US is following suit with a recent announcement of a target of 30 gigawatt by 2030 and more to come soon thereafter. While these are important steps towards decarbonizing the electricity grid, we can look at it as an even bigger opportunity. Offshore wind farms can become the anchor technology for more integrated offshore energy islands. The installation and operation of wind farms put in place work boats and logistics resources, an ocean savvy workforce, and critical port side infrastructure that can be leveraged by other emerging ocean energy technologies. In addition, the availability of offshore electricity, mooring systems, and dry space inside towers and platforms give us new opportunities to use the ocean space more efficiently. Europe is already pushing in this direction. A joint Dutch-Belgian effort is co-locating a seaweed farm between the towers of a wind farm 25 kilometers offshore in the North Sea. There are also plans underway in Germany and Scotland to combine offshore wind with hydrogen generation and then send the hydrogen back to shore by ship or pipeline. This is a strategy to fully utilize the electricity produced even during periods of curtailment or to completely bypass the electrical connection to the grid. I believe this may only be the start for many different types of floating energy islands. One opportunity I see is to integrate offshore wind with seaweed farming and hydrogen generation to feed a biorefinery to produce not just hydrogen, but a whole portfolio of renewable fuels to serve the needs of the maritime industry, as well as those back on shore and in the air. Doing the processing offshore would dramatically reduce transportation costs for the raw materials. In addition to energy, these offshore biorefineries offer tremendous opportunities for fertilizer production, not just nitrogen fertilizer to replace the very energy intensive Haber-Bosch process, but also phosphorus and potassium. Finally, CO2 is a co-product in many biorefining processes and may be sequestered to result in carbon negative fuels. We can take the CO2 sequestration even a step further by utilizing the wind generated electricity directly for various forms of direct ocean capture of CO2. I'm sure that you can think about many more combinations. The critical question, however, is how do we best assess which ones make sense and how to drive them towards scale? For that, we have to integrate technologies and co-design solutions with markets and business models and frame it in the context of marine spatial planning. Given the expense of testing any technology in the ocean, much of this planning will require extensive modeling capabilities, which we have to make great efforts to build. But ultimately, we have to go out into the ocean. And when we do, we have to remember 
that we are not alone. It is important to design energy islands to prevent pollution, both chemical and noise pollution, as well as to avoid entanglement risks. These efforts will be critical to build and maintain social license to operate, especially as we are scaling the technology. Our ultimate goal for floating energy islands will be to not just produce sustainable energy products, but to enhance and restore the ocean environment. I really thank you for your attention and I look forward to hearing your ideas about novel ocean energy islands. Next up is my colleague and RPE fellow, Dr. Jake Russell. Thanks, Mark. Hey, everyone. My name is Jake, and I'm a fellow here at RPE. Following on from Mark's discussion of energy islands, I'll be taking a closer look at a technology that could really have enormous potential in this space, ocean thermal energy conversion, or OTEC. I'll be providing some examples of new directions that can enable cost competitive scale up, but I'm also really interested to hear your thoughts on what's needed to help this tech reach its full potential. So let's dive in. Every minute, five quads of solar energy strikes the Earth's surface. Every 90 minutes, the sun provides enough energy to power all of human civilization for a year. However, about 70% of this radiation falls on the ocean. Most of it is absorbed and converted into thermal energy, resulting in a perpetual thermal gradient composed of warm surface waters and deep cold waters. On a daily basis, the thermal energy absorbed by the ocean amounts to about 250 billion barrels of oil. So the question becomes, how can we most effectively harness this massive source of energy? In order to produce power most efficiently, we need the largest temperature difference possible. This can be found in the thermocline, where the temperature at the surface can be up to 25 degrees warmer than waters about 1,000 meters down. This difference is maintained year round and constantly regenerated, providing us with an essentially infinite heat source as well as an infinite heat sink. However, Extracting usable energy from this relatively small temperature difference can be difficult, as we know from Carnot. A difference of 25 C means we're working in this regime at about 5 to 6% theoretical efficiency. Accounting for this theoretical limit, as well as the geographical constraints, there are still an enormous 7 terawatts of power available in the ocean at any one time. We multiply this by the high capacity factor of 97%, which essentially means that it's a resource that is always on, to calculate that over 700 quads of energy are available for the taking per year. This is nearly twice the world's annual consumption, making it one of the largest single natural resources available. There are many uses for such a massive oceanic power source. Its high capacity factor allows OTEC to provide baseload power for island or coastal communities. As Mark mentioned, OTEC could be integrated with liquid fuel or hydrogen production islands, either for subsequent transport to the mainland or to provide refueling stations for the future shipping fleet. Or as David and Greg will discuss, it could be used to power oceanic carbon capture and storage stations. Today, ocean thermal energy conversion relies entirely on the organic Rankine cycle, which uses a low boiling point working fluid to drive a turbine. The organic Rankine cycle was developed for geothermal and industrial waste heat collection and is not ideal for use on the high seas. It requires moving parts that are prone to failure, huge volumes of water pumped up hundreds of meters. Furthermore, the large capex required has limited its widespread adoption. An OTEC station costs about 10 to $30 million per megawatt divided evenly across its components. In order to really take advantage of this enormous resource, we're going to need to think outside the box for each one of these components. The heat exchangers and power generation together make up about one third of the capex for a typical OTEC system. Can we think about alternative techniques to extract work from heat in order to increase scalability and reduce maintenance and engineering complexity? Solid state thermoelectric materials convert a temperature difference directly into electricity and have long been considered for collecting low grade waste heat. These can operate for long periods of time with no moving parts and minimal maintenance and can also be integrated directly into heat exchangers. Recent developments in liquid thermocells also show promise for OTEC. These devices make use of opposite redox reactions occurring at the hot and cold electrodes and are ideal for harnessing small temperature differences. 
They have lower volumetric power density than solid thermoelectric devices, but space is of less concern on the open ocean. More importantly, they have been estimated to cost about 100 times less per watt than solid state thermoelectrics, possibly enabling massive scaling. The thousand meter long pipes required for pumping water make up another large capital cost. On top of that, for current plants, about 30% of the energy produced goes right back into pumping up cold water at rates of hundreds of cubic meters per second. But is this necessary? What if instead we were able to bring the working fluid down to the cold source? This would require moving much less volume, leading to less pumping energy and smaller pipes. We can imagine what is effectively a large scale heat pipe with a vapor phase working fluid going down and a liquid phase coming up. Or take this one step further, construct a huge flow thermocell with paired react reactions happening alternately in the cold and warm regions. Are there other creative ways that we can avoid pumping these huge amounts of seawater? The platform and mooring construction make up one of the single largest cost components of current OTEC systems. Following on from Mark's talk, can we think about ways to integrate new OTEC systems with existing oceanic platforms? For example, thousands of oil rigs dot the Gulf of Mexico, where warm waters provide an accessible gradient. Or can OTEC be integrated with new offshore wind or solar projects to maximize energy extraction per area? These systems could even interact synergistically. For example, waste thermal energy from a floating PV farm could be used to further heat surface water for OTEC which could simultaneously provide cooling for PV panels. Finally, considering that OTEC already involves pumping huge volumes of seawater, could we think of additional uses for this water? My colleague Hallie discusses mineral extraction from ocean water in his fast pitch, which would deal with similar volumes. Coming up, Greg and David will discuss oceanic carbon capture and storage. Captured CO2 could be injected deep below the surface. Or maybe we could use nutrient-rich cold water to fertilize algae farms or provide localized surface water cooling. So in summary, we have one of the largest renewable energy sources on the planet sitting just under the surface, but it will take creative and ambitious thinking to be able to harness its full potential. If you have ideas, please reach out to me or any of my colleagues. I'm excited to dive in. Thank you. I'm Greg Keel. I'm a fellow at RPE. And today I want to talk to you about oceanic carbon dioxide removal. The oceans are a tremendous force on Earth, and that includes their force on the climate. In the next few minutes, I hope to convince you that oceanic carbon dioxide removal is not only an alternative to other negative emissions technologies, but an essential to the technology to develop because the oceans are such a force on our climate. But first, some primer on negative emissions technologies or technologies that remove CO2 from the environment. This plot shows greenhouse gas emissions forecasted out through the end of the century. The top yellow line shows a business as usual case and the bottom red line shows the path to less than two degrees C of global average temperature rise. As you can see, there are two things that we need to do to move from the top line to the bottom one. The first is to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions everywhere we possibly can. And the second is to build out negative emissions capacity or the capacity to remove CO2 from the environment. And this second point is key because according to the IPCC, without negative emissions technologies, our pathways to 2C are limited and our pathway to 1.5C is non-existent. All negative emissions technologies operate within Earth's carbon cycle. And the goal of any negative emissions strategy is to reduce the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. That time rate change of CO2 in the atmosphere is primarily a consequence of three fluxes of CO2 into or out of the atmosphere. The first one is the anthropogenic CO2 flux or the amount of CO2 exhausted into the air by human activities. The second one is the terrestrial CO2 flux, or the balance of photosynthetic and plant respiratory activities. And the third is the air to ocean CO2 flux, or the exchange of CO2 between the air and the ocean. Now, the tricky thing is, is the latter two terms here depend to a certain degree 
on the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere at any given point in time. The air ocean flux is driven by the difference in concentration or partial pressure of CO2 between the air and the ocean. Likewise, the terrestrial CO2 flux is a function of the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. So there's a feedback, almost like a tug of war. Pull too hard on any one of these terms and the others can react and counterbalance it. And that's exactly what's happened with anthropogenic emissions. According to the latest assessment report from the IPCC, of the 375 gigatons of carbon emitted into the atmosphere by human activities, a full 155 gigatons of carbon has been absorbed by the oceans, about 40%. In fact, in the last 250 years, the ocean has gone from near equilibrium with the air even a slight source of CO2 to the air, to taking CO2 out. And this plot shows how that oceanic uptake has evolved over time. It shows on the top the emissions averaged per year for three half century periods leading up to the year 2000. The bottom plot shows the air to ocean flux. As you can see, as the emissions increase, so increases the strength of the oceanic sink. So what happens when we wind back the clock? Well, many models predict that as emissions are reduced, so too will reduce the strength, will the strength of the oceanic sink be reduced. As a result, many scientists predict that for every unit of CO2 removed from the atmosphere, sucked out from the atmosphere by an atmospheric negative emissions technology, less than one unit of CO2 is removed from the atmospheric store. And this is why oceanic carbon dioxide removal is such a critical technology to develop. It allows us to directly affect the ocean atmosphere exchange. It gives us another person on our team in the tug of war. The process does so by removing dissolved CO2 directly from the ocean. At the highest level of abstraction, the process, also called direct or indirect ocean capture, takes a seawater input stream and separates out CO2, dissolved inorganic carbon, leaving a seawater stream behind with less dissolved inorganic carbon. This process has a number of advantages over other negative emissions technologies. The volumetric concentration of dissolved inorganic carbon in seawater is higher than the concentration of CO2 in air. So this means that less system throughput and thus potentially less energy is needed to remove a single unit of CO2 from the ocean than it is from the air. The process also represents a direct reversal of ocean acidification caused by anthropogenic emissions. And finally, because ocean capture is ocean-based, it doesn't compete with land for other uses like agriculture. There are a number of ways that oceanic CO2 capture might be performed. And an electrochemically driven process has been demonstrated experimentally. It uses bipolar membrane electrodialysis to affect a pH swing, converting dissolved bicarbonate back into CO2 where it can outgas. But studies still predict high energy consumption and high capital costs and challenges with operating in a marine environment. The space is early, and more work is needed on everything from new chemistries to biological or bio-inspired approaches, integrations with storage, and cost reductions for existing processes. The atmospheric CO2 concentration is a result of interdependent CO2 fluxes between air, sea, and land. Effective negative emissions means managing those fluxes. Developing technologies for oceanic carbon dioxide removal is therefore an important part of mitigating risks and maximizing effectiveness in carbon drawdown. We need more innovators in this space. If you have ideas, please reach out to me or to any of my colleagues on the OCEANS panel. And now I'd like to introduce you to Dave Babson, who's going to tell you even more about the great things going on in carbon dioxide removal in the oceans. Hi, I'm David Babson. I'm a program director at RPE, and I'm going to talk to you guys about reversing the carbon flows of deep sea oil rigs. 
Greg already showed this plot. This plot shows the path that we need to follow in order to keep global temperatures below two degrees of warming. That's the red line in the center. What was outlined is that our ability to keep the global temperatures below this uh, critical threshold cannot be met through emissions reductions alone. That opportunity passed us by in the 90s and we didn't do enough. In order for us to follow this path, we actually need to build out and grow negative emissions to contribute to the net emissions. Those are the blue shaded uh, uh, area below the line here. And it's actually quite substantial. As you'll see is that the contribution of negative emissions to net emissions is, is very large even before the crossover point. Uh, we need to achieve about 10 gigatons of carbon removal by 2050 and 20 gigatons of carbon removal by 2100. And this is to say that one of the largest industries on the face of the earth is going to become carbon removal and management. Uh, to give you some estimation of just how big this is, we have to add up a number of different material flows to get to 20 gigatons per year. For example, all of the material flows in the U.S. trucking industry, all the you know packages that you know that come from Amazon and and all of the you know things that are that are transported by by truck in the United States, only amounts to 9.8 gigatons uh, per year. But to get to 20, we'd have to add on top of that all of the material flows through U.S. pipelines. That would give us another three gigatons. And then from there to get to 20, we'd have to add on top of that both uh, global cement and global iron ore production. So from the Department of Energy standpoint, we need to develop the technologies that are going to service this known to be future, very big, very large um, industry with technologies that are low cost and energy efficient. And so RPE is actually funding research and development into multiple different types of negative emission strategies. These include engineered, biological, and hybrid approaches. In the biological approaches, what we're looking to do there is to uh, recognize the natural carbon cycling that occurs in, in natural environments and to engineer these systems to enhance their carbon removal capacity and augment their ability to store that carbon over time. In engineered systems, these are systems that can uh, you know, be designed to be modular and to remove and store carbon um, in unique ways, including direct ocean capture, direct air capture, or things like enhanced weathering and functional uh, storage of carbon in product. And finally, in hybrid uh, carbon removal solutions, what happens here is that you leverage that natural carbon cycling that occurs in biological uh, systems, but you match up the accumulated biomass of the removed carbon with downstream engineered systems that avoid uh, the possibility of that carbon getting back into the atmosphere. This can include building with biomass, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, or biochar. Now, because this industry is going to be so large, as I outlined earlier, there's no silver bullet technology that's going to allow us to achieve those that scale of carbon removal uh, with, with one single technology. In fact, the future CDR industry is going to be uh, diverse and a, a broadly distributed industry and these technologies will need to be developed, uh, de-risked, and the cost will have to be brought down and then deployed strategically into uh, particular environments and local economies that make the most sense uh, for, for those local uh, systems and for maximum uh, efficiency of the overall carbon removal industry. Now, today what I'm going to talk about is you know, one particular approach and one particular opportunity. I'm going to talk about offshore continental um, storage uh, offshore continental shelves and their ability to, to store carbon and the infrastructure that we have in place from the oil and gas industry to have to potentially uh, leverage uh, and, and take advantage of these opportunities. So there is an immense gigaton scale storage capacity, uh, you know, among our offshore continental shelves. And uh, in order to achieve the you know, carbon removal capacity that we need to service this negative emissions industry that I outlined, there's going to need to be about 10 to 14,000 CO2 injection wells to be added globally by 2050. And one place to really look for this is at our offshore oil rig uh, infrastructure that exists. You know, this is a substantial, you know, somewhat dirty legacy, but there is a new potential here. There are 12,000 offshore uh, oil rigs worldwide. And even, you know, just among the uh, coastal waterways of the United States, 
uh, there's over uh, 500 plus gigaton capacity uh, available. And we also have a lot of, like I said, legacy infrastructure that, that, that could be leveraged. Now, in order for us to design systems that could reverse the carbon flows of these systems and, and take advantage of the wells that are already in place and actually you know, take carbon out of the oceans, uh, bring it up to supercritical or to some pressure that's necessary and, and pump it underground to, to store it in the wells from which we brought oil, we need to think about end-to-end -end, um, engineering. In the same way that the oil industry today brings together expertise from uh, you know, geological formation experts and geologists, uh, mechanical engineers, and others to, to understand the formations, to engineer the systems, to, to bring oil from those formations up to the surface, and then the downstream chemical engineering, process engineering to convert that crude oil in, into product. We're going to have to amass an end-to-end -end expertise um, for these systems to ensure that they are optimized and that they operate in ways that are as efficient as our oil industry today, but just in reverse. <clears throat> Some of these considerations are going to include the energy considerations and how it is that we are going to bring unique renewable power or at least sustainable power to these systems uh, you know, at oil wells where we are powering both the direct ocean capture systems that are removing carbon from the oceans, the, the processing hardware to, to pressurize it to appropriate um, pressures, and then the system operations to integrate the, the, the components to actually run these uh, carbon capturing and storing uh, systems uh, at these, at, at these uh, depths. Another consideration, of course, will be the reservoirs themselves. What are their capacity? How can CO2 be injected? The integrity of those wells? And, and the, the implications for how we might monitor those long term to ensure that the, the carbon that we're storing there is safe and is secure. Um, the other one is the actual rigging itself, the design requirements for the CO2 injection, uh, looking at the, the age of the well, the optimum bottom hole location, the suitability for the CO2 uh, such that it will be uh, stored and perhaps even mineralized in, uh, for, for you know, very long-term storage um, over time. And then, of course, uh, another component that, that is, would be a new component to these reverse uh, carbon flow systems that, that doesn't exist for, for oil wells is the long-term monitoring. How do we ensure that the, uh, the advantages or the benefits that we're getting from removing and storing carbon are actually being maintained over a long period of time? And how do we hold down the cost of this long-term monitoring? So I will say this, if it was possible to profit from taking carbon out of the air and to put it underground instead of taking it from underground and putting it into the air, uh, I have no doubt that we could solve the climate crisis. So the question is, how do we build an end-to-end -end industry that reverses the carbon flows from the oil industry? please reach out to me. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, here's my contact information, and I look forward to taking your uh, questions. Thank you. Hello, everybody. So this is, I'm Mark von Keitz. I'm one of the program directors at RPE, as I mentioned before. And welcome to the second attempt on this fast pitch session. I really appreciate you coming out in such big force. I think I've seen over 170 180 people right now. Uh, I would like to uh, encourage you to send in questions uh, through the Q&A box there. They're going to be curated. Uh, we already have a little bit of a head start with some of the questions that were asked previously, but maybe we want to revisit some of them. Uh, the, you can actually promote questions that you think are very interesting, and the one that has gotten the most uh, interest so far is how is RPE working to ensure that ocean technology is developed responsibly with respect to its impact on the ecosystem. And I maybe just take start taking that and then let the other people chime in. We have the Mariner program now running for uh, close to four years. 
And one of the critical elements there from the beginning was, for example, a design requirement that we asked people to design the farm structures in such a way that they are minimizing negative interaction, for example, with marine mammals to by avoiding uh, slack lines, so to minimize entanglement opportunities. And in the whole process, it's really the other element that is critical for that is what you call marine spatial planning. There is a lot of designated uh, high value marine areas and recognizing what species interaction there exists, what the value of the ecosystem is. And we really believe that that's a quintessential part of developing this. This is all encompassed by what we call social license. And social license is something that is really important for industry to continue. And I think each of the technologies will need to very sincerely approach social license in a way through acknowledging risks that are there and being very transparent about how an industry is dealing with these risks. So anybody else that wants to chime in, please go ahead. I can make one note um, and, and Greg can jump in on this as well since we work together on um, drafting the um, the direct ocean capture funding opportunity and and the and selected awards. One of the things that that we did in preparing that funding opportunity is we recognized that we don't want to um, create additional uh, environmental challenges while trying to solve uh, climate change. And to do that, we um, made it a requirement that the CO2 that was being removed from the ocean systems came out as CO2 and that it didn't produce, you know, uh, other byproducts uh, that would be, uh, you know, carbonates or some other sort of thing that would, on the scale that we were uh, looking to achieve, you know, uh, the gigaton scale would create substantial, um, you know, material management uh, challenges for, for those byproducts. Um, so, you know, we, I think one of the ways that we can um, ensure that we are uh, uh, addressing potential environmental uh, challenges is to, uh, you know, maintain that philosophy of first do no harm. So um, that, that's one of the things that we did specifically uh, for that, for that funding opportunity. Greg, was there additional thoughts that you had on that? You know, not really. I, I think Dave, you, you really covered it pretty well. I, I think I would just add that I think that's one of the great, I think, advantages of, of oceanic CO2 capture um, as dissolved inorganic carbon removal, because you're you're directly reversing what anthropogenic emissions have caused. Um, anthropogenic emissions have, have put CO2 in the atmosphere, which has been driven into the ocean. And, you know, a lot of the technologies that we're looking at are, are just simply directly re reversing that pro process. Okay. Great. There's another question that I want to ask uh, is directed at David. Uh, can you comment on the technical challenges associated with carbon sequestration on land versus the ocean? So, <laughs> yeah, sure. I can certainly comment on it, but I am not an expert in the, you know, the specific, um, you know, technologies around the, the storage of carbon in, um, you know, in these uh, systems. I think uh, some of the, the the biggest challenges, as I was outlining it in my talk, is that we need to you need to think about these negative emissions pathways as end-to-end -end engineered systems. Um, the fate of the of the carbon is important. Uh, I think from a you know, if you're looking to store CO2 um, in geologic formations, uh, the relative benefits of, you know, having the wells on land versus in oceans um, may be just, you know, the ease of, of managing the infrastructure to get the CO2 to the injection well and, um, you know, having uh, greater abilities to, to monitor um, and manage uh, those those wells um, in ocean systems. Uh, the, there will be you know challenges of you know, 
uh, of sourcing the, the CO2. That's why they would need to be coupled with uh, direct ocean capture systems uh, and then monitoring those long term. But if there are other potential um, ways to store this, and maybe I'll turn it back over to Mark to, to talk a little bit more about this. In the biological, um, if you're using a, a biological uh, route, um, you know, you can think about on in terrestrial systems, uh, storing carbon in soils and, and you know, growing trees and, and storing carbon in biomass. Those can be easily, um, you know, monitored in, uh, in terrestrial systems. Um, and in ocean systems, accumulating the biomass um, and then, you know, uh, safely se sequestering the, the carbon uh, from that, that biomass long term um, presents a whole bunch of other challenges. And I know Mark has done some thinking about this, about how you can leverage the ocean bioeconomy to become um, a uh, carbon uh, remover uh, and carbon managing uh, type of uh, environment. And I'll turn it back over to him. Yeah, thank you, David. And actually, I wanted to maybe just use your hint as a plug for an upcoming session that we have on Thursday on biological systems for carbon sequestration. And in that context, blue carbon and ocean-based processes are uh, explored in conjunction with terrestrial biological carbon sequestration opportunities. So this is taking place at about, I think, two o'clock uh, on, on Thursday. So just wanted to make sure. And I think uh, that's an, an opportunity for you to check out this in a little bit more, or you can look at several aspects of the Marina program as well. So there's one quick question on floating offshore wind, and I can uh, take that one. Uh, it was even in the opening session and the general session on Monday, it was mentioned, uh, especially as a strong leadership in the United Kingdom. But at RPE, we have, under the leadership of uh, Program Director Mario Garcia Sanz, uh, started the Atlantis program, which is specifically geared towards uh, development of new areas for improving offshore wind technology to really drive down the cost of that. And I would encourage you to take a close look at some of the Atlantis performers in the technology showcase. Uh, I saw that there were some questions for Jake. Uh, uh, so are there opportunities for utilizing OTEC for producing fresh water uh, or desalination from ocean waters and shipping it to shore? Jake? Um. Uh, yeah, sure. This is a, a, a really good question. Um, and actually, this is something that's, that's already been done for the, for the couple of uh, pilot OTEC plants which have been built, um, especially in island communities. They actually do use the pumped water uh, for both uh, air conditioning, refrigeration on shore, as well as uh, desalination. Um, because I think the point is, you know, you're already moving these really huge volumes of water, um, which, you know, can then be used to, to desalinate. Um, on a larger scale, you know, once we start talking about putting OTEG out in the, in the deep ocean uh, and maybe doing hydrogen production, I don't think uh, desalination would be economically competitive uh, compared to, you know, hydrogen production or something, especially if you're talking about desalination on land. Um, but for kind of near term uh, first use case uh, scenarios, I think desalination uh, could be a, a really important step. Okay, thank you. There's a question for Greg. Uh, have you considered the notion of accelerated weathering of magnesium silicate minerals, such as olive and in coastal environments, which would harness also the kinetic energy of these settings? Yeah, that's a great question. So. Uh... There's certainly interest. I have interest, and I think there's certainly broad interest in the agency in carbon mineralization and ex accelerated weathering. Um, I think our our key uh, interest here in in in, in the ocean space is, is, as David mentioned before, um, we're interested in uh, capture and storage without creating um, excessive amounts of byproducts that that sort of create 
some substitute one environmental problem for another. Um, and, you know, we're interested in any and every idea you have uh, in that space that, that, that could rise to that, uh, to that challenge, so. Okay, thanks. Here's another question for David. What would be the life cycle impact of taking CO2 to remote offshore locations for sequestration? How will it be viable? Um, <clears throat> what would be the life cycle impact of, of storing carbon? Um, I think that would be a good thing. I, one of the things I was proposing uh, here is- It's maybe more the uh, energy cost related system. with the transport. So that's how I interpret that question. Oh, I, yeah. I mean, the, the energy costs are going to be, uh, you know, quite sub, uh, substantial, you know, for both doing the, car, you know, the, the separation of the carbon dioxide from the, you know, from either air or water. Um, transport could be, um, you know, a factor. Um, and that's why it's so important that these end-to-end -end systems are designed um to be the most energy efficient that they can be and are 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 designed with uh, renewable uh, or sustainable low carbon power um, as an option. Otherwise, you'll be, <laughs> you know, there's no use in, in, in doing carbon removal if it takes energy and you're using a, a, a carbon intense uh, process to power it. Um, so um, I think, you know, to, I, to try to be responsive to the question about the life cycle um, implications, the I, I will say that the maximizing the uh, life cycle um, benefits of doing carbon removal is the goal, is the design parameter around which you are optimizing. And so um, you have to take a look at the individual uh, wells and, and end fate of the, of the carbon and design the end to end system to maximize um, uh, that uh, the efficiency for uh, promoting the greatest uh, life cycle benefit. It's a, somewhat different than how we think about uh, other similar large, um, you know, carbon implication systems like the oil industry that is, you know, exclusively, you know, been optimized for, you know, energy efficiency and those sorts of things to hold down the marginal cost of producing um, CO2. It's a different design consideration when you're thinking about optimizing systems for, um, carbon uh, efficiency and removal and not necessarily uh, energy efficiency. Okay. Uh, the one thing I just wanted to add to that is that there's even consideration of taking the existing oil pipeline to reverse the flow back to, uh, so that you use them as a conduit to bring CO2, uh, liquefied CO2, to the old uh, drilling locations and then pumping it back. So uh, I had another question here. Uh, no. So Jake, could you expand on what the critical gaps in technology are to make oceanic thermal energy comp competitive? Yeah, this is a this is a great question, and, it, and it's kind of the the focus of my presentation. But I guess to answer that, we have to ask, you know, competitive with what? Is OTEC ever going to be competitive with uh, terrestrial power generation sources? Um, or should we think about it more in terms of using the power generated for the in situ uh, purposes, such as you know the the um, uh, dock or, or dock or you know desalination, as, as someone else mentioned? Um, and I think if if it is going to be competitive with terrestrial sources, I think the major barrier, which I I didn't talk about in my pitch, is the how do we get the energy generated to land? You know that that cost of getting the energy generated out at sea back to the land um, is is really difficult and expensive right now. The undersea cables are are kind of prohibitive, especially at at great depths and long distances. Um, could some other technology, you know, help us do that in a more economical way? Uh, hydrogen generation and transport. Um, you know, that, that would have to be looked at, uh, or even something like wireless power transfer, if we can um, 
you know, beam power from out at sea back back to shore in an economical way, um, this could uh, start to make it competitive with terrestrial sources. Um, but I, I think I think for now we should be, you know, until the technology is really um, developed more. Um, I think we should be looking at how it can be used, the power can be used in situ uh, to produce, you know, benefits which you can't get otherwise from terrestrial land sources. Okay, great. Uh, I wanted to direct the next question at, to Greg. It's how does direct ocean capture scale up to industrial scale? I think that's such a great question uh, and, and with great challenge, I think, is, is the short answer. And I, I would point maybe specifically um, to a couple things. One, um, I think, uh, I, I hope to see more, more emphasis and more interest on, on, on pretreatment systems and understanding the full sort of scale of, of, of the system in R&D activities. So not, not just the, the core of the, the separation process itself, but everything that has to be done to to, to get the ocean water from its raw strait into a into a form that's compatible with the separation process, I think, you know, developing those in a in a cost effective and environmentally friendly way is really important to achieving that scale. Because as I think the um, you know question poser is alluding alluding to, this is a very very large amount of water that we're talking about. So I think you know pre pre treatment systems are key, and I think you know the the second thing question that that is maybe a bit more nebulous, but has been, you know, sort of hopping around in, in, in my head is, is how do you make uh, an ocean capture system that, that doesn't look like a chemical plant um, so that you can avoid having to, uh, you know, flow these massive amounts of water through an engineered system? How do you, how do you make a system that doesn't look like a chemical plant, but do this at scale? And um, I, I'm just posing the question. I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but uh that that would be a route that I think, if that were answered, could could be tremendously impactful. Yeah. Maybe I just want to add to that. So in the context of the macroalgae cultivation, when we think about uh, gigaton scale capture of CO2, the benchmark that we're typically using is that one, gig, one ton of CO2 is, corresponds to about one ton of dry seaweed. And so that means we have to look to capture a gigaton of CO2 growing one gigaton of dry seaweed. And you can just make some basic calculations, but if, you, if we take some of the more optimistic projections based on what we have been doing in the MARINA program, we are looking at an area that is a little bit less than 2% of the US EEZ. So uh, that's, maybe the size of the state of Colorado, uh, but it's still a very significant area. So under, but at the same time, we can also look at how much area we are currently having alter, under cultivation in the US from an agricultural point of view. Uh, it's, it's something that is a big challenge, but I, I think it's not, not necessarily impossible, but I think it will take efforts technologically, but then also questions of real social license and getting it implemented and then finding the right business model to, to uh, connect that with. Another question I just wanted to quickly touch on, we don't really have, there's the question, what are some technologies RPE could invest in to help reduce emissions from large vessels? So while I don't have anything where I can point to specific uh, individual technologies. We have one of our program directors, Dr. David Tu, that has been really thinking about that quite hard, and he might be a person for you to engage with. We also yesterday had our ocean panel, blue economy panel, uh, and there we had uh, Dr. Satorius uh, Mamalis from the American Bureau of Shipping, and he is very much interested in finding ways how to decarbonate decarbonize the, the ocean logistics and shipping sector. And some of the ideas that have been were mentioned there was really looking for alternative low carbon fuels. The very first step would be just using LNG uh, relative to bunker fuel, but then going further to hydrogen or ammonia as 
biofuels and other people have been talking also about biofuels. There's other technologies that are thinking about uh, incorporating carbon capture right on the ship as, as another opportunity. So I think it's a very, very critical area. I think uh, global shipping is on the order of 3% of global CO2 emissions. And so it's definitely something that's worthwhile. And so please uh, find David too. Uh, as one person to discuss that in more detail. And Mark, I'll jump in and say, I'm also really interested in this topic area. So please reach out to me as well if you have ideas in this space. Thank you very much, Jake. And I didn't mean to to cut you out there. So that's that's really, I think- And we also, I have Mark, to... have the uh, EcoSymbio program that was just uh, announced last week, which is seeking to produce those, those low carbon fuels, renewable fuels, um, that you know could be used uh, to do fuel switching in these, um, you know, in these vessels, uh, essentially allowing uh, them to continue operating uh, uh, with uh, existing infrastructure while uh, reducing to significantly the life cycle emissions of of that industry. Okay. Uh, one question here. Uh... Do you anticipate collaborating with DOD to repurpose nuclear powered vessels to drive CO2 capture processes? Uh, anybody wants to take on that question? If nobody wants to take it directly, I think the one comment that uh, I can make is that there is definitely a long standing experience in the Navy with operating. Uh, nuclear, small modular nuclear reactors and doing so safely. And so that's definitely something that should be in the consideration as an energy source to drive it. It's not yet 100% clear how cost effective that is going to be, but I think from a technological point of view, there's a long track record and operating history that can definitely be very beneficial. Uh, let me see, we are at 38 minutes. I'm just trying to, uh, so I don't know if anybody here on the panel has looked at it, but uh, the question was brought up, CO2 capture in the ocean. What is your view of CO2 clathrate hydrates as a long-term storage methodology? I don't know, Greg, have you by any chance looked at that or anybody else on the panel? I can't speak to this one in, in any great detail, I'm afraid. Okay, that, that's fine. Uh, uh, David, I don't know in your exploration between the various basins, have you looked at uh, differences between Norway's North Sea where CO2 storage in oil wells has already been proposed and the potential for the Gulf of Mexico? Um, <clears throat> no, I haven't looked at the at the you know specific difference between those various uh, you know, geological uh, systems, um, so I can't comment on that either. Um, but you know, one of the things I did you know uh, identify is that there are you know many of the the you know formations that you know we used to produce. Um, you know, crude oil in the first place from the uh, established infrastructure that we have are amenable to um, storing uh, CO2. And so, you know, this is one of these areas where, as I was noting in my talk, um, there's going to need to be, um, you know, some strategic thinking and bringing together of the right types of expertise to actually engineer end-to-end -end systems. Uh, you know, RPE is investing in some of the component technologies to drive down the cost of doing, let's say, uh, you know, CO2 separation from ocean water or other, you know, individual pieces. But, you know, the way this is really you know, going to be able to scale um, is going to require, you know, putting together the types of, of, of teams and with the types of resources uh, to to actually uh, 
promote a large scale uh, end to end uh, thinking. Okay, great. So Mark, here's a question. I'm not sure if you can see all the questions uh, that, that we're seeing. There's one for you. Um, what are some of the challenges in producing hydrogen from seawater? Thank you, Jake. Uh, that's that's really, I think, a, a very important question. So there's there's two ways. A lot of the electrolyzers currently in use actually require uh, desalinated water. So you you can't use uh, salt water for that directly. So you would need to have a desalination capability on site in order to produce that. And from it's my understanding that that is something that's technically mature enough to do that. Uh, at this point, uh, but it is definitely an additional expense that you would have to deal with. Uh, the other part is that there are some considerations. There is definitely some work going on with direct uh, hydrolysis of seawater. Clearly, the issue is some of the chlorine in there, uh, the chlorides that can then be uh, oxidized to chlorine. And so, but there are even some technologies where people are thinking about utilizing that in the context of uh, a combined hydrogen production and at the same time CO2 uh, removal process from seawater. So that's an area of like uh, electrochemical ocean, direct ocean capture of CO2. And there are some uh, people that I've actually seen planetary hydrogen is one of them that I'm aware of. Uh, and so we, uh, and Greg Rao, I think is actually on at the conference. So I think there is uh, definitely, it's, it's an area that still needs further uh, exploration on really how to drive the cost down. And it also is a connection. How can we jointly uh, utilize the offshore efforts to maximize all the benefits that we can obtain from these still very challenging locations to deploy. Uh, any other thing that you see, Jake, that we might, that yeah. I might have missed? Sure, there's one, there's one highly voted question here, uh, and this can be for the whole panel. Do you foresee profitable opportunities to monetize carbon capture within the context of ocean CO2 capture? Maybe this for Greg and, and Dave. Carbon price is right, absolutely. Got to pay to play. People are willing to pay to, you know, do what we need to do to address climate change. If people could profit from doing, you know, taking carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it underground instead of um, profiting from removing it from underground and putting it in the atmosphere and causing climate change, um, believe me. In fact, some of the same companies that have, you know, engineered these very um, you know, efficient means of, you know, obtaining oil and producing all kinds of va valuable, useful uh, chemicals and products um, would, be, you know, would uh, certainly show up and, and profit from, from doing the reverse. So um, the answer, the short answer to that question is, if the, the, car if the carbon price is there, if people are willing to pay for this, uh, there will absolutely be um, the technologies that come that allow people to profit from them. Okay, maybe that is a good final statement for this panel. I think we have reached actually the end time of 11.45, at least that's Eastern time. Wanted to thank, first of all, my fellow panelists for participation here, but then first, then really more importantly, even all the attendees and the participants for your questions and your interest. And once again, please take the opportunity to either engage with us directly or to uh, follow up with some of the performers that are already operating in this space uh, during the Tech Showcase session. So thank you and enjoy the rest of your day.